Hi, everyone, and welcome to Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly Beatles podcast where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles together and solo and all things Beatles related to. I'm Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York City. WFUV is a non-commercial public radio station. We broadcast at 90.7 FM and 90.7 FM HD2, and we're online at WFUV.org. Uh, I'll be celebrating 39 years on the air at WFUV at the end of the month. And joining me, uh, as is the case each I was going to say each week. It's really every other week on things we said today. Longtime radio personality was dedicated virtually his entire 40 year career, broadcasting career to hosting Beatles oriented programs. You know Ken from his work on um, XM satellite radio and his uh, radio program, a syndicated show, Every Little Thing, his video cast that he co hosts, Talk More Talk a solo Beatles video cast. It is my pleasure to welcome Ken Michaels. How are you, Ken? I'm I'm feeling great, Darren. And um, looking forward to doing this show in particular for a very special person. Absolutely. And uh, it's Ken, it's me, and it's our buddy, Alan Cozen, an acclaimed writer, journalist, and music critic. He also has been active for some 40 years. I still don't know what the deal is with us in 39, 40, 41 years doing what we do. Uh, but Alan is uh, the co-author of the new book everyone's talking about. Well, one of the books everyone is talking about these days, uh, The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973. Alan wrote it with Adrian Sinclair. And as always, it is my pleasure to welcome Alan Cozen. Uh, one of our hosts. How are you, Alan? Good, Darren. How are you? And how is everyone out there in Radio Land? We're recording this on Friday, February 17th. Um, tomorrow, Yoko Ono celebrates her 90th birthday. And we're going to celebrate Yoko on things we said today. Today, with our special guests, let me quickly mention them, and then we're going to throw it to Ken, and then we'll reintroduce everyone. Uh, you know Madeline Baccaro. She's been here on Things We Said Today in the past. She's been on Ken's uh, YouTube channel, and she has written the definitive, with a capital D, book on Yoko Ono's life, uh, In Your Mind, The Infinite Universe of Yoko Ono. Madeline, welcome back. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. And a true Renaissance man has joined us today, Dan Richter, who worked with John Lennon and Yoko Ono back in the day. Uh, it feels like just a few weeks ago. Uh, and Dan uh, knew them very closely, knows Yoko, is in contact with Yoko today, a dear friend. And it is our honor to welcome Dan Richter to the show. How are you, Dan? Uh, I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to be here. And before we get chatting about Yoko... Ken has Yoko-centric news for us to get things started here on Things We Said Today. Ken? Yeah. Um, let me just say that normally we have quite a bit of news here on this show. I just want to whittle it down to a couple of news items here that focuses on Yoko or Yoko and John. Uh, first of all, in celebration of Yoko's 90th birthday, Sean has made a virtual wish tree for people all over the world to post their wishes online. And this is also in association with One Tree Planted. Um, and they will plant real trees in Yoko's honor. Their website launches publicly on Yoko's 90th birthday. That's tomorrow, February 18th. For more information, you can just go to wishtreeforyokoono.com. Also, a big news item here is that Yoko and Sean Lennon have authorized a new documentary called Daytime Revolution, which is all about the week that John and Yoko co-hosted the popular daytime talk show, The Mike Douglas Show. This will include archival footage from each of the shows and as well as new interviews with six surviving guests, including Ralph Nader, who will tell the story of the behind the scenes stuff that went on during that unprecedented week. Yoko and Sean did not participate on camera, but they did approve and creatively consult on the project. Companies involved in this production are The Shout Studios, Creative Differences, 
and CBS Media Ventures. It is directed by Eric Nelson and work on the documentary has now wrapped up. It is 108 minutes long and they are now looking for a distributor. Hmm. Something new to look forward to there. It's interesting that they've done the documentary. It's been years since the actual uh, five programs have been available. They came out on VHS mm -hmm. in a box set some years ago. I don't even know what year it was. And um, and those have gone out of print. And maybe this will lead to their reissue, which would be very cool. Very cool. What was cool about that whole thing is that it was my mother's favorite show. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, they were talking to, and she monopolized the only TV in the household all my life. So now my people are on her show <laughs> with, you know, John and Yoko and their guests all week long. And she couldn't turn it off because it was her show. <laughs> it was it was the same. Same for me, Madeline. My mother, uh, I mean, the weekday afternoons, I don't remember the order, but it was like, um, match game, whatever year it was, yeah. match game 75. Uh, and then eventually leading into the Mike Douglas show would come on. And I don't, I was, I was seven years old and I'm surprised that I don't have a vague memory of it because Mike Douglas would always be on. And mm -hmm. I would have reacted even at that age to John mm -hmm. being on John and Yoko being on, on the show. I don't remember it, but watching those, those old programs back, they're a hoot. Just the meeting of the generations. Well, and, I was 14 uh, and I had a kind of an idea. You know, these were radical people at the time, you know, that they were bringing on. But I felt like Bobby Seale was very, very eloquent, the Black Panther leader. And they really got their messages across, I felt, you know, I didn't. I didn't think they were crazy. Jerry Rubin got a little out of control. But <laughs> other than that, I think it was very effective. And then the next week, probably Sergio Franchi was back or somebody yeah. that uh, that made uh, that made the uh, older folks happy. I watched it at the time. I, I was in uh, probably a senior in high school and uh, I, I didn't understand it. And maybe Dan can explain um, an aspect of this. I mean. I couldn't stand Mike Douglas. Mike Douglas to me was, it, it, it wasn't just that it was my mother's show. It was my mother's show for a reason. She liked crap and, <laughs> and, and that was him. And, and, and I just didn't understand. I mean, I, I kind of understand, you know, I've, I've read John talking about how, you know, you want to reach people through what they listen to, but it just seemed to me like, why is, why are John and Yoko, and all of these other people on the Mike Douglas show of all places, you know, why not something else? Um, do, do you remember any deliberations about that, Dan? You know, um, you know, I don't because I was, I was pretty much in London. Most of the time I would come over to New York about once a week for a day or two. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually didn't, because of that, I didn't, didn't see the shows, mm -hmm. but to speaking to what you're saying is that, John Yoko wanted to speak to the a largest audience possible and also speak to not necessarily an audience which were their audience who were going to agree with everything they said. They was they were great. They, they were, and Yoko still is, great communicators. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what was going on. You know, that's the way I see it. It was 90 minutes, five days in a row. Who could get more at the time than that? <laughs> With a broad, you know, a broad middle American audience. That's wonderful. With Mike singing Michelle at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I understand really pissed John off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like he couldn't tell that that was mainly Paul's song. Right. Yeah, who saw when it, when it came out on, um, well, I mean, I, I, I had sort of... Um, very down generation dubs of it before it came out on on VHS. But I always thought of, you know, why don't I just make an edit where I cut Mike Douglas out of any aspect of it that he's in, <laughs> unless he's talking directly to John and Yoko and just That's leave true. the rest in because the rest had, you know, there was some great stuff in there. John playing with Chuck Berry, um, you know, Ralph Nader, Bobby Seale. I mean, it was it was it was interesting. Are uh, you sure, Alan, you didn't actually make a 
Mike Douglas highlight reel. You did the opposite of what you like. Yeah. The real stories coming out now. Yeah, you know, appeared like on the Mike version. Douglas show uh, shortly after when, when um, "Feeling the Space" came out. She performed "Angry Young Woman" and she was on a panel of uh, an interview panel, and it was um, a comedian and, and uh, Spanky from Our Gang, and mm-hmm. he was talking his barbecue sauce, and he interrupted her interview. And he threw a barbecue sauce jar to Mike Douglas and almost hit Yoko in the head. <laughs> like, what is he doing? But she was showing Mike her box of smile. It was just really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. He just ruined it. You know, uh, one thing that, uh, and, and why I watched a couple of them recently. Uh, John has that personality where he would have actually blended right into that whole um that whole generation and then if he was there alone for example um i could see him in a daytime talk show uh mode because he was fun he was adaptable um and you know by the third and fourth show he'd have an apron on cooking in the fake tv kitchen um (laughs) there was a charm to john that really uh you got to see a little bit of a different side of him uh at times during those five episodes Hopefully these shows come out again. At least the documentary is going to be a fascinating behind the scenes look that, uh, you know, if there's any fly on the wall type stuff that's Mm -hmm. in there, that could be a lot of fun. And uh, any time that Alan can get to uh, catch some more Mike Douglas, I guess, is always a good thing. um, (laughs) John, for the wish trees, I wanted to mention. So those are um, they originated as uh, they were influenced by the wish trees in Japanese temples where uh, you go and you purchase a little plaque and you hang it on the tree, but it's pre-written. So Yoko always thought, well, why can't people make a wish of their own? And she really feels like whether they're read or not, they still have the same impact and she's collecting them all and she puts them in the base of the Imagine Peace Tower um, in Iceland. So they're supposedly all in there. And the funniest thing was in a Q&A one day, someone said to her, well, what 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 would you wish, you know, if a genie came onto the beach with a lamp for you? And she said, "Oh, I tell him to go back in his bottle and leave me alone." <laughs> <She's> <laughs> so funny. <laughs> but I've seen her tying wishes to trees. You know, she's had them in different installations, and one of them she wrote, "Hello, Earth. I know you, and you know me for a long time now. So let's keep working together." Like she didn't really wish; she was just communicating with the Earth. <laughs> So that's Yoko. What was that acorn thing that they did, uh, Madeline? Acorn piece. Um, one was facing east, one was facing west. Yeah. Um, in Coventry Cathedral, which that's had been right. yeah. during the war. And they yeah. got flack for that because the the whatever he was there, the the minister, he didn't want them to take place in the event because they were not married at the time. Oh. And somehow they got around that. And then they they had a Rhode Island bench, you know, placed upon it. It was declared. They had a plaque there and everything. And of course, this the same night the, the acorns get dug up and stolen by Beatle fans, and they had to send their chauffeur to kind of <laughs> retrieve all the stuff that was left over. And then they had somebody protecting it for a while, but they never got to do anything peaceful <laughs> no. in peace. No. So Ken, um, that was uh that was it for uh, the Yoko centric news uh, for today. These those two items. Yeah, I just wanted to um, also say, and, and I had the same reaction watching Mike Douglas that I think that John and Yoko were. They were very engaged with all their guests, you know. Mm-hmm. And I know that they they hand picked a lot of them. I'm not sure if they did all of them. I'd be curious to know because uh, George Carlin was a guest that week That's right and that was at a time when he was really becoming more and more popular if john and yoko were aware of of him or if that was mike douglas's people but it, just the mere fact that so many of those people were picked by those two i had the- heard a long time ago that i was under the impression that they picked all of their guests but that might not have been the case on a couple of occasions i forget the george carlin uh, but that was that was the point, wasn't it? I mean, it was they, you know, they were yeah. hosting the show and they were bringing the people they were interested in and that they wanted to introduce to that big demographic. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, I'd love to have taken the shows um, 
it was a way to take the shows and have them broadcast for the very first time today in this age of social media and whatnot to get what the read of the the viewer in middle America, what the general consensus of those being exposed to these individuals for the first time, how many were open-minded, how many shut the television, how many uh, were enlightened by what they saw, uh, and, and how much of John and Yoko's message was being heard by this population that would otherwise not have been exposed to it. You know, if there was a way to gauge that, then no, today probably would have been. I think if you were a fan of Mike Douglas, and even if you were sort of a previous generation fan of Mike Douglas, not particularly into John and Yoko, um, you had to take seriously probably the fact that he had them on there for a week. I mean, in a way, that's a statement of of his you know that that's that's him saying i want you to listen to what these guys have to say you might agree with it you might not agree with it but but give it a listen and i think that if if you were a fan of mike douglas you might have taken that seriously and actually sat back and given them a listen you know that that's mm -hmm. uh, a possibility and it's pretty i guess it's probably why I, I wonder how much mike douglas increased his audience mm -hmm. by that's what it was for <laughs> yeah i mean that's What's a, that's why he did it, you know, yeah. It, yeah, to, yeah. to reach those people that he, and he wasn't. Didn't, he didn't speak too nicely of Yoko afterwards either. So really, <laughs> for his ratings, uh, that's too bad. Really, well, you know, at that point, Yoko was was still getting just jumped on all the time by everybody. You know, I mean, the fact that during the uh, the thing with um, um, Tutti Frutti, or uh, it's my brain again. It's going, you know. Oh, you, oh, with Chuck Berry. Chuck yeah. Berry, you know, Chuck she Berry? did the she did the, the the kind of singing that she did in those days, and people were she got a lot of flack for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Dan, a question for you, because uh, uh, you worked, you knew Yoko from the mid '60s. You said I think before we started recording, 1964 is when you met her. Uh, yes, I met Yoko in Tokyo in the spring of '64. Uh, she was doing conceptual pieces there at the Sugetsu Art Center, places like that. And uh, I was, uh, I had been studying mimetic, for you know, this is, sounds so technical. I've been studying mimetic forms around the world, and I was very interested in the No and the Kabuki theaters, also the Bunraku Doll Theater. And so I was spending a, a month or so in Tokyo where I would go to the theaters, the different theaters each day and watch them rehearse and trying to figure out how they how they accomplished what they accomplished. And um, we we had mutual friends. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I, I had taken, I'd taken a boat from Bombay to, uh, to, to Japan with Jed Curtis, who was a, a conceptual composer who had done work with Yoko in the States and in Germany. And um, so he said, well, you've got to meet Yoko. And so the first thing we did when we got to Tokyo, we went over to Yoko and Tony's place and, and met them and we hit it off and we used to see each other almost every day. And uh, uh, we got very close, Yoko translated some of my poetry and you know, whatnot and whatnot. And we became friends. And then later when I was working for Stanley Kubrick in London, Yoko turned up to, um, to do, um, I guess it was a, a thing on the destruction and art battle at the, the roundhouse that was sponsored, mm -hmm. by the, sponsored by the ICA, the Institute for Contemporary Arts. And Yoko and I were, Christmas, almost Christmas Day, we ran into each other in the subway and came up for Christmas dinner and whatnot. And I had just started working for Stanley and they had just gotten to town and they were looking for an apartment. So we ended up getting these two apartments side by side. And we just lived next to each other until, you know, John turned up and John Yoko fell in love and they, they ran off to live at Castles. <laughs> Well, it's awesome that you met her in Japan, because that's, of course. Yeah, you know, the nice thing about my relationship with with Yoko and John is that it was through Yoko and mm -hmm. not through the rock and roll business. You know, I mean, John was, John was always trying to get me to work for them, you know, and I, you know, I just sort of was enjoying myself and 
I did, I got to do some record covers and do all kinds of, you know, I was doing, so it was fun, you know, and, uh, and I was fascinating all these rock and roll, you know, sort of rock and roll gods who were wandering around bumping into each other. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I was not a rock and roll guy. And so mm -hmm. after the, the police got involved in the, in Mallorca, uh, when we, we, Yoko and John and I picked up her daughter, Kyoko and brought her back to the hotel in Palma, um, I would. I was part of a press conference to explain to everybody what was going on. And John, John said to me, "You can't not be working for us. You're representing us." You see, so so I said, "Okay, I'll work for you." And then they start giving me a salary or whatnot, and and then immediately John said, "Okay, now that you're working for us, you know, <laughs> I'm going to teach you about rock and roll. You got to know something about. It. You can't be working for me and not know anything about rock and roll. I, I know about rock and roll, John. I mean, little Richard, you know." And uh, he said, no, but what about Rosie and the Originals? <laughs> said, oh, okay. And, uh, you know, and then he would bring me these, all this clothing, you know, because they, they had all this stuff left over from uh, Baker Street, you know, the, the boutique. And, and, and he'd, he'd start dressing me, and, you know, and making me wear all this stuff. And Yoko's, <laughs> Yoko's sitting there watching, laughing, you know, as, the, as uh, Sean did all this to me. But you came at them from the... The Japanese aesthetic, like you were there to study no theater. And you even said in your book that her face reminded you of a weeping ghost in a no play. And yes. That whole well, the, sensibility. Very much, very much so. You know, the, 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 I don't want to get so tech, too technical. This is sort of a thing, but the, the no theater is a very austere, it's, it, there's a Japanese aesthetic concept called shibui, with, you know, it's restraint, you know. And it's Andy Warhol saying less is more and whatnot. But the No Theater has three basic characters, and some are gods that wear these, they call them the shita, that wear these beautiful masks and, and move slowly and imperiously, you know. And Yoko always reminded me of these wonderful mask figures because she, Yoko always had, a, I always see her face as a mask because so much is going on behind it, you know, right. you know, it's just this boiling back inside there, this amazing mind, you know, and right. then the mask that they presented to the world, you know. But, yeah, and that she revealed herself slowly uh, over time and yeah. you know, came out of her shell just like. And I just feel like even in the no sounds of the no theater, how the, the sounds kind of start off low and then they escalate and they're just really yeah. slow. And that that's how her music kind of builds and grows. Yeah. I mean, and I was, I was, a, I'm very lucky because I got to know Yoko as she was coming out of a down period, you know, so that she was re, she was discovering herself as, as, as an individual unique artist. And, you know, and separating, she had been originally, everything she did in many ways, she was involved with her first husband. Um, you know, there was, John Cage was there and all these important people, but Yoko was getting pushed uh, aside by the men. And, you know, she had gone through really a crisis because of this, because she is such a, an original and such a strong artist and has uh, that, she need she needs to be Yoko. She needs to be this this amazing creature, this wondrous goddess, you know, whatever she is. And she was just discovering that. And she was, you know, because she was really on her own. Tony, who was she was married to at that time, really sublimated himself to her work. He wasn't trying to impose anything on her. He just wanted to help her do her her vision. Hmm. And so when I, I got to watch Yoko grow and evolve over the years from that sort of from that nadir or that low point. And it's uh, it's been an amazing journey. Yeah. Well, now that you're here, I feel safer to say things like how how almost magical she was. She's just such a special person. And the where she sees things that we can't see, she sees things that are invisible. She's all about negative space. You know, we're looking at a half of the thing that's here, but she's showing us the half that's missing. And one of her coolest things that she said is history isn't what happens, it's what didn't happen. Mm. And she looks at things in a whole other way. That's probably the correct way. I mean, we're misplacing our values. We don't, uh, we're not aware of our own inner powers. And she's trying to just show us all these things. And everybody's just spewing back hatred at her. I, I don't understand it. Well, she's come on, she's, that's changed, yeah. you know, 
And I, I uh, about four years ago, there was a concert of her work at the at at the Disney Hall here with the the Philharmonic Hall, and other other artists were going to do her her songs and things like that. And I knew she was in Tokyo, and uh, so I, I bought it. I, bought, I was going to go anyway, but I, I got a ticket and I was there. And and Elliot Mintz, her publicist and longtime friend, was there. And I said, "Did she get in?" You know, did she make it? And he said, yes, she got in last night. We had sushi. And here's a backstage pass. I will make sure the two of you have some time alone before everybody you know, comes in. And I went back afterwards and, and and I said, Yoko, you've come so far. It's so wonderful to see this. And she said, I know I was crying through the whole thing. And then I started, it was terrible. You know, I started crying and because I, I just kept remembering all the, the vitriol and hatred and everything that had been piled on her. And to finally see that people were, could see her, they could see what she was doing. I'm and, so happy she got to see that. Oh, it was so wonderful. It was, it was such a, the night was amazing, you know, and, and all these, I, a lot of people I didn't know. I knew uh, St. Vincent, you know, um, Annie, what's her name? Um, Annie uh, Clark. Yeah. Um, who, she read from, from Grapefruit you know, because she didn't have a song prepared. I guess they booked her at the last moment. So she, she stood on the the empty stage just reading the stuff from Grapefruit to wow. 3,000 people all just digging it. It was just, so oh, it was just wonderful. So great. Well, you, you also explain John ha being as if he didn't belong in this world either. And this is where, you know, they connected. Yeah, the, you know, if you don't, if you didn't know them together, if you didn't see them together, it would be it's almost hard to explain. But the, it's as if they were two halves that were wandering through the world and didn't quite fit any in anywhere. And you know, oh, they got the you know, flack from this one, and then they got you know misunderstood and whatnot. And then they met each other, and it was like boom, 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 and this energy came out. And so they made a complete thing, and uh, we had them. Um, Still have a piece of it. We had some um, stationery at Ascot, which was a picture of John and Yoko kissing with the one like head. Yin -yin. Right yeah, yeah, there was the yin and yang, and it was it was perfect, you know, because that's what they were like. And and while they were together, they were just always just the ideas that were just coming out all the time. You you it's it's reminded me of uh, my friend Arthur Sir Arthur Clark, who had the problem that he'd start a sentence and halfway through he have an idea so big that he'd have to change the sentence. Well, John Yoko were like that. They were just right. idea. We planned what we were going to shoot the next day for Imagine, you know, and everybody would be sad and, you know, they got, we got all the props and things ready. They'd come down in the morning and say, oh, well, we changed everything. We've got all these <laughs> ideas, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and, and they, complete, they really completed each other. And they it's were, like they had this overflowing knowledge that they needed to share. And yeah. It, it was just it's like Yoko knew things John didn't know, and John knew things that Yoko didn't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I can re I can remember uh, in New York, the three of us would get in the limo in the evening, and then Yoko would take would have, we'd drive downtown and visit all these wonderful Fluxus artists and people, and John was just amazed to just see all these people, you know, discover all this whole this whole world, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, you know, he I think Yoko also taught him that he was a great artist, that he wasn't just a great rock and roll artist, that he was an artist. And, and it wasn't something that he had to try to become. It was something he was. Exactly. Even and he, he told her that she was a rock star and they just yeah. kind of took it from yeah. there. Exactly. 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 You actually just read my mind because I, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to see what John saw in Yoko and what John drew from Yoko. Uh, but let's reverse it. What did John bring to the table that Yoko embraced and made her own? Uh, what about John was what, a tr what that pulled Yoko in? That's well, I, I, yeah. I, if, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I, I, I think um, it was a dem if we go back to demographics again, who you're talking to. And John, John like Yoko said to John, you, when you sing, I want to hold your hand, 100 million people all around the world hear it, you know, 
why don't you say something important? You know, and and but at the same time, Yoko had all these amazing ideas and was this amazing person, but her demographic was the the avant-garde of the avant-garde of the avant-garde of the art world, you know. I mean, yes, John Cage would know who she was, or Marcel Duchamp would know who she was, but outside of the outside of that rarefied atmosphere, she did not have a large audience. She was beginning to get just starting to get it. I think Bottoms film number four, uh, which is the if you know is the one where we had people walking on a, a, a circular a plat platform like a circle and you know, people walk on it and the, the camera was focused on their buttocks. So it created a, a cross four quadrants. Um, and, um, and that film, you know, people started responding to it. Also, I think when she wrapped the line in Trafalgar square, uh, you know, people had to pay attention, you know? Uh, so she was, she was, she was moving towards that larger demographic, you know, and John just helped her. You he know. swept her up and brought her way higher than she ever yeah, was just, ready whoa, for. Come on for the yeah, ride, you know? yeah. But also what she says that he did for her is that she always thought in a very surrealistic way. And he brought her down to earth. He, she even, the quote is, he woke me up from my mind game. Because mm, yeah. he gave her kind of a root. And with the music, he gave her a beat and kind of, you know, reined her in a little bit. And she still went pretty far out. But at least she had, you know, a structure and something to work with and that's what they did for each other they were just so perfect and in, in nourishing each other nurturing each other and becoming whole they were and they, and, and they just loved each other you know the greatest like, love story ever I mean, Romeo and so Juliet, you know. oh, yeah yeah and, and when when she married him she said you know i woke up the next day and the whole world was one big mother-in-law and it's even though, you know, they didn't necessarily have to get on with their own families because they didn't live near them and they were much older. They still had the world to contend with. And the world ended up really putting enough pressure on them to make them split. Yeah. I wanted to ask something that, um, based on what Madeline just said about, you know, John giving her a beat and reining her in a bit. Um because I was just thinking about her music um, this morning, and you know, there there are basically two Yokos as a composer. One is the Yoko of Two Virgins, Life with the Lions, and the Wedding Album, which are you know not entirely. I mean, Life with the Lions has some short tracks, but but they're basically extended pieces um in a very avant-garde style and then starting with yoko ono plastic ono band she was writing pop songs and she seems never to, to have really gone back to the first style um well, she has a little bit you know in her later albums she she really did like in the i'm talking about in the 2000s even you know so and it's interesting if you know in retrospect thinking that she started with some of the first songs she so showed to John of her own was Song for John, that very delicate piece. Mm -hmm. Remember Love was her very first That's true, yeah. um, song. And Listen, the Snow is Falling was one of her earliest. Yeah. Um, you know, but then she was doing the noises with John Cage and she did the Ornette Coleman thing and went right into you know, the Yoko Plastic Ono band, which is funny because Sean Lennon actually has this great quote. She goes, she goes from not being into rock and roll to inventing punk rock, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it she just went with it. I mean, you give her uh, Ringo and Klaus Vorman and, and a George Harrison drone loop, which I believe actually is the one from Tomorrow Never Knows, if you really listen to it from Greenfield Morning. Oh. You know, she's going to run with that. And and yeah. most of what's cool about that album is what how she treated it after she, her and John, they put on all kinds of effects. And because now if you listen to the sessions that came out, they're really just jams and they lose all their like the ghostly appeal and the atmosphere that she actually put on there and that you're hearing on the record. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the vocal style? That vocal, you know, to somebody who doesn't get it. You know what I mean? And here's something say off that album for the very first time. That was not just Yoko making noise at the mic. There was there was something going on there. How would you describe it to you know, I even to some extent to me? 
you know, no, I don't, I don't, I don't completely understand. Um, it's whether she wants to admit it or or thinks it. The Japanese influence is really there. I mean, if you listen to Japanese music, it's kind of jarring. And the no theater kabuki, you know, it's it's all kind of dissonant um, minor chords, minor sounds, and the vocals are very uh, emotional. Um, and then there's the thing that she explains where she was told not to go near the servants' quarters when she was a child because... You know, they didn't want her to hear the language that these people were using. But one day she went down there and she said that uh, a, a girl was talking about her aunt having given childbirth and all the screams and the noises she was making in the process. And Yoko was shocked. She's like, oh, my God, because in Japanese society at the time in the 1930s, especially women were supposed to be super quiet and austere and you know, you wouldn't know about such things. And that that just stuck in her mind. And also she she had so many traumas in her life, you know, with the war and, and seeing Tokyo burnt to a crisp when she gets back there and the distance of her parents with, you know, she just had a horrible childhood and all these things needed to come out in some way. And that's the vocalizing that she does. Also, I think, you know, to Madeline's point, the the I I, I spent some time in Beijing just going to the different um, Peking operas, you know, and and about the fourth or fifth night, I suddenly they weren't squawking and wailing anymore; they were singing, you know, because my I, my ear attuned to that, and and you know, and I think Yoko had to. Her her background is battling this point out because out of a Japanese traditions, that doesn't sound uh, squawking and noisy and strange to ears that are familiar familiar with that. You know, we we're but we're biased by our own you know keys and chord structures and things that, right. that we've grown up with. But you go you uh, and most of most theaters prior to amplification used uh, used sounds that would carry over 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 space um carry or carry over to a large audience well they're highly expressive also there's the form of hitai right hitai um, it's a technique in kabuki theater and you know you just hear women screaming you just hear <laughs> the, the crying. yeah well would you say um that Yoko was an influence when John would sing certain songs like Cold Turkey, where he's screaming and all the guttural stuff at the end. Well, there's a demo of Cold Turkey where John is going, he sounds exactly like Yoko. It, it, I wish he used that one. Yes, of course. The, the thing, thing about John as a performer, and I had... I heard the I'd heard the records and I had uh, I'd stood beside them at on the stage at um at Toronto you know but the it was I think it was when it was when we were recording Imagine I was standing there I was just a few feet away from John he was right by the window and I was right at the board and what stunned me because I'm a I'm a trained actor uh, you know and actors do a lot to try to get to reality you know to really get in touch with things and John was giving so much he, he, uh, during Jealous Guy. I mean, it was just so moving. And I realized that's that's why he's John Lennon, because he can do he can do this. It's like it's like Martin Brando can do something. You know, it's it's, it's But do you think John wasn't even acting? John was just expressing and telling the truth all the time. Never he never learned how to act. He never yeah. learned, you know, he did everything they did, they just did. You know, they were didn't go to music school or, you know, study guitar. Well, she knew more that, you know, she was classically trained. She could write notation. She could tell him, you know. She was doing that during the recording. Right, right. She was, she was actually acting. writing down the songs. Right. But this is interesting. I have this quote about acting in, in that she said in 1971. This is so intense. She goes, um, 
Ultimately, the true essence of a person can never be captured on film due to the influence of the spotlight. Perhaps this is why we can only see actors and actresses on screen. You can have a molecule, the smallest substance in the world, and you don't understand how it moves. And someone wins a Nobel Prize for saying that it moves in a continuous pattern. And then the next year, somebody wins a Nobel Prize for saying the opposite. Molecules are so small, once you put a light on them, you change their movement and you can never tell for sure how they really move. People are like that. You can attempt to film reality, but once you turn on the light, people become self-conscious and their thought processes change. You never really can tell what the real person is like. Therefore, there's a part of life that can never be recorded or articulated. Language fails you because language simplifies reality. Logic fails you because logic is also a simplification. Logical processes can destroy this intangible aspect of life. Whoa. So great. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's quantum mechanics. You yeah. Know? I mean, and she's not a scientist in any way. No, like no, she comes I, up I, with this stuff. <laughs> Heisenberg, you know, when you, you, you change something when you observe it, you know. Yeah. It's, um, no, a acting is, um, I don't go back to it, but the, you know, the thing about acting is that there's some people have a magic, you know, about them, you know, uh, this, this thing. And, and, and John had it. I mean, I don't, it's not, wasn't a, an actor. He's just sure he's certainly been in films. I think actually how, how I won the war was that the one, the, mm -hmm. uh, he was very good in that one. I was, I was very impressed by that. Um, the, uh, but, he had this magic, you know, that just was just there all the time, you know, and a sense of a sense of truth, right. which, uh, you know, it it may not be the truth, but it feels like the truth. And mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's 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 what art is. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's how you feel. It's, it, it, does it feel true, whether it's true or not? Yeah. And then she knew that even revealing so much. Uh, was she says there's another great one she's like we tried to share as much as possible with the world there were elements that isolated us from the outside world the very concepts that we held cut us off and now i still have that but aloneness is different from loneliness sometimes you're too impatient to share things those early records we made created repercussions things we discovered that you want to share with the world sometimes you have to wait in those days we wouldn't wait as though as we went on we wised up about it so, you know, they knew they had this knowledge that the world wasn't ready for yet. Yeah. Yeah. And it's wonderful. Like the two virgins is like they, they're like born again. They start from scratch at that point, you know, and they start rebuilding. Uh, and it's amazing. And, you you know, you mentioned life with the lions and all of those other things. That's that's all. They were the, the first steps, the first the, this wonderful progression that's going to go over and assume the world eventually. Yeah. You see their relationship as being completely healthy because apart from when they were separated, um, in your book, Madeline, there's that quote from Arthur Janoff about how John was um, non-functional at the time and how he completely needed Yoko. Were there times when he was so completely dependent on her? And do you consider that to be healthy? And did it work both ways? Well, look, they were both damaged people mm. I mean, from childhood everything and led them to drugs so and plus they had such an extraordinary life i mean he's individually and then compounding that double and not only that all the stress the the, the deportation being followed by the fbi the pressures of her child missing nobody could withstand it so uh I guess the separation was what really helped them. I mean, Yoko really just knew what to do. She knew that she needed a break. And she sent John off with, of course, with May Pang, which everybody gives her hell for too. Yeah, I mean, there are plural marriages. There's so much going on in relationships these days. And that was a simple thing where she sent him away with a trusted assistant, you know, to really watch over him. And guess what? He came back alive which wouldn't have happened <laughs> if May wasn't yeah. there. Yeah, John, John is, as we all know, John had a, had a really tough childhood, you know, and uh, he had a, he had a lot of scars and a lot of burdens. And, and uh, that's why, you know, he like 
it was very bad. He, he tried to avoid drinking because he wasn't a very good drunk, and sure. all of the, a lot of this junk, you know, this mess that was in his soul, you know, would would come out. But uh, uh, and and Yoko, as you said, Madeline, you know, I mean, she describes they've they've been evacuated from Tokyo, and she she and Setsuko, her sister, are standing on the road trying to find food. You know, asking passersby if these, these little girls begging for food who had had been part of the 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 elite of uh, of Tokyo you know and the boy where they had they come down so both of them had all of this junk in them you know this this pain and we all do I mean you know that's you're talking about humans now you know um, mm -hmm. and there's and healthy uh, no the healthy thing was that they found each other yeah Absolutely. And they, they found that they found how the relationship worked. You know, it wasn't, a, you know, John had always sort of dominated the women in his, his life, you know, uh, he, well, he, well, the groupies and I guess Cynthia was a very, uh, very sweet person, you know, was, you know, would sort of go along and try to make sure everything was okay and whatnot. But he had, and Yoko was, was a strong woman, you know, and I think John needed a kind of stability, female stability in his life. You know, the idea of a, a woman who is not going to leave him or not going to die on him or not going to abandon him. Um, I'm not speaking poorly of Mrs. Smith. I think Mimi, Mimi did a great job as, as she could. But John needed that. And I, I think Yoko supplied that. And uh, um, they did the best they could with what they were giving yeah. Well, we're all humans, right? That's what it comes down to, you know. And um, I'm always nervous, a little nervous about talking too much about personal stuff uh, about people, you know. I mean, one of the things is that I, I'm lucky to have been very close to certain people in my life, and I, you know, I don't want, you know, I can go into, well, on this day they did this, and he stepped on his toe, and you know, all this junk, you know. I, I don't want to. I don't. I don't think that's important. Hmm. No. But an interesting thing about the the girls like foraging for food and and that kind of thing was um you know they were sent to this abandoned farmhouse by her mother who was told that it was in better condition than it really was she probably paid a lot for them to stay there and she sent them with silk kimonos and things that of value that they could trade for food and she sent a servant with them but after the first few days the servant kind of abandoned them and here they are, the brother and sister, and Yoko was the oldest. She was about 12. And uh, they're in this farmhouse. And that little, her most famous work really is the hole to see the sky through. Yeah. And everybody just thinks that's a cool thing. You look at the sky through the hole. But what it really is, is, you know, they were laying on the floor and this farmhouse had a hole in the roof. And on these horrible nights and days, they'd wake up in the morning and they'd just see the sky and this little hole in the roof and that's what she created that from yeah she was she was an artist from the get-go you know yeah. i mean just you know she was just she's yoko she was she, she was you know yoko with her it sounds corny but yoko is yoko from the very beginning you know and unchangeable too you know I've, I've i've watched very many creative people over their lifetimes you know be turned away and lose faith and whatnot and but she has a with all the attacks she went through and all that she was able to stay steadfast and just stay on track and just never 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 even wavered you know how was she able to do that? I mean, that that requires an incredible amount of fortitude and 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 belief in what you're doing. Did and and you saw this close up, um, Dan? How yeah, she's how one of the strongest human beings I've ever met from that perspective. Uh, she just, you know, and I and I could, I saw her times when she was really being beaten up on. You know, I mean, the way the Apple office was treating her. You know, in those those early day, early days. You know. Um, it was just terrible, you know. It was just terrible, and but she could have, she could have sort of given in and changed and whatnot. But she, she was incapable of changing. She was so true to herself, you know. And uh, the world has come around. I have a chapter, and it's really all about 
her inverted wisdom in a way. She kind of turned everything on its head. She always turned the negatives to positive and she always saw the opposites. And, you know, she would say, do you know what your obstacle is? Maybe, you know, the thing you thought was an obstacle is really giving you a great help. It's all how you look at it. And she just uh, took the, the jabs that she was getting as if they were acupuncture. And instead of hurting her, she turned, she used them as a form of healing. And I just think, you know, the yin and yang, it's so Buddhist philosophy. She just knew how to take everything and, and twist it mentally. You know, she, everything was in her mind, you know, she always wanted you to think about the work. It wasn't just to look on, on the wall and, and, and admire it. You, she wanted, that's why I call the book in your mind. And yeah. the real reason, Dan, which is I should show you one day is. Um, the, er the early work, she was called music of the mind. Right, right. And I have a, a signed Indica program, you know, catalog, whatever it is. Yeah. And she signed it in 1967. And it's got some pages that eventually ended up in grapefruit in there. So I didn't really look through them because I'm like, yeah, hey, I read this. OK. But one year I flipped it open and there was a sentence that was typed out. And it said, um, when you burn a chair, the chair in your mind doesn't disappear. Mm. And the words in your mind were left out of the text and she wrote them in by hand and they just jumped out at me. And I said, that's wow. the title of the book. Wow. wow. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. That was such, such an exciting show because it was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it was, uh, I don't know. It was, it was the, the, the way the, the yes on the ceiling was so small that you needed the magnifying glass to see it. You had to go through this, climb the ladder, pick up the magnifying glass, not fall off it, read the thing. <laughs> and I found a funny story about the ladder. She had stolen it from her neighbor and he went, she thought, oh, he'll be okay with it. It's in the, in the museum, you know, and he was really mad, but, you know, she painted it white. It was in there. Yeah. <laughs> when, when John and Yoko came to New York, uh, they were fully um, involved in the whole political scene uh, in, in the village in lower Manhattan. That was around the time that Yoko really embraced uh, the feminist movement. And that became front and center, uh, the topic of, that would be in her, in her songs on albums like Approximately Infinite Universe and Feeling the Space. Uh, could you talk about that period where Yoko embraced, um, you know, right on sisters, the early mm -hmm. 70s feminist movement. Well, I think um, a lot of the women in her family were, fem her grandmother was in this pioneering feminist group called the Blue, Blue St Stockings, I think. And it was named after one in England called the Blue Steps. And, you know, she she had it in her from early on. She knew as a child, she used to wear her hair loose and long in Japan and defiantly because that wasn't accepted in society and um she wasn't really a militant feminist that's the thing like now today forget it but even back then there was like Gloria Stein and all them and these women were right. like really you know they gave her hell for singing that song I want my man to rest tonight and she's like well you're being soft on men and she says you know no they need help as much as we do and she simply I didn't, I, I didn't see her I didn't see her adopting the the politics of feminism. Right. I, I, it's just Yoko's Yoko from the beginning, as Madeline said, she was. I, I was well. I was very aware that when I first met her in Tokyo, the fact that she was sort of coming away from the influence of men who had had pushed her around, you know, and and tried to mar marginalize her. And so I always thought of her. I don't. It's I. I the word feminism is. Um, she's just a. a Women, women, what's it that women up hold up half the sky, don't they? You know, I right, mean, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I have a chapter called Woman Power, and it's about John as well, you know, having all those strong women in his life. And it's really interesting, um, and how she kind of feminized John, you know, and it, it well, she it brought up, a, excuse me. I know, I was just gonna say, she brought she allowed John to have a feminine side, right. You know, if if you know what I mean. In other words, John once said to me, "Well, if I hadn't been a rock and roll star, I would have loved to have been a hairdresser." Yeah. Uh, but because he, you know, he 
he was a he was a tough guy. He, he you know he you know whatnot. But he also had this, and it's it's not when you say a feminine side, it that almost sounds pejorative. Um, it wasn't that. It was that he he had a a, a gentleness, uh, uh, but whatever. And Yoko permitted him to to be that way, right. Yeah, and she even talked about, you know, in nature, like the queen bee is the worker and the sea, the male seahorse carries the eggs and the dragonflies eat their mate. Like she was just showing how, you know, just you got to be flexible. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. Would it be all right, uh, Dan, to talk about John and Yoko's heroin use? I've written about it, so I, you know, I'll, I can tell you what's already out there. Um, the I I yeah. when I had when I had uh, left the I was the lead performer of the American Mime Theater. And I was a really good mime, and I didn't I didn't want to have to kiss foundation people's asses at cocktail parties to raise enough money to starve as a as a mime. So I had taken off around the world now, but I was very interested in. in mimetic forms, the things I had learned, I wanted to learn from other things. But I was very influenced by um, the bee people and whatnot, and I started taking drugs. And uh, I was writing poetry uh, under different kinds of drug experiences, and I, I, um, I became a registered heroin addict in London, you know, supposedly doing research. And of course, I got I got badly hooked and whatnot. I had a pro I had a real problem with it, and I I had heard John and Yoko were using had been using drugs, and I don't know whether it was associated with the the traffic accident, the car accident in in um, Scotland or not, or what had started. There was a lot of London in 1969, 68, 69. There was a lot of drugs around, a lot of drugs being used by by everybody. The uh, so I was concerned for them because I, I knew what a terrible thing it was. And we had, uh, my wife Jill and I and the kids had gone to, uh, gone back to the States and I realized I just, I couldn't do it. I had to get back to, to England. And when I got back, Yoko uh, had, had said that they had been using, told me they had been using some drugs that they were very nervous about buying it from funny people and what they didn't know what they were getting and whatnot. And, uh, so I did help them get pharmaceutical stuff, uh, you know, that was safe, mm -hmm. and uh, and also I we all we all talked about and went through the process of of kicking, you know, uh, which was uh, which we the three of us did at the same time, you know. So they used for a short period of time. I never thought of them as serious users. Um, you know, they I thought of them. We have a term called chipping. You know, they were sort of playing with it a little bit and they they used it enough so they got they would get sick if they stopped you know and um and i know they did take methadone for a while afterwards to tr transition out of it but it 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 was ne it was never a, a big a problem as a lot of the other guys around like you know, like keith you know keith richards and other people who were, there was a lot of there was a lot of heroin in london in those days so was it for recreational use that they did it because I, I thought that part of the reason why they did was because of the pain that Yoko was going through at the time by the way that the world and the media was treating her. That may have been part of it. I, I, I you know, I don't want to, I don't want to guess, you know. Um, you had several miscarriages as well. And yeah, they, they, that was, and also the, the, the car accident, you know, they got really beat up in that, you know, there was a, a, a a lot of pain associated around that. Um, and they were being treated very badly, you know, I mean, really badly. You know, I'm bringing this up because, you know, anytime these days the Beatle breakup is discussed, John's heroin use is always brought up now. And sometimes I wonder if it's really overdone. And you observed John and Yoko at this time. From what you observed, do you think it had any effect whatsoever on his relationship with the other Beatles or his creative uh, output? The heroin? Yeah. No. That was, you know, they were using heroin. You know, they used, they, 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 
pain, whatever, you know, experimentation. They they ended up using it for a period. But the, the Beatles, the breakup of the Beatles had started long before. Um, you know, I mean, it's not just John and Paul. It's, I mean, George was in a position where he'd get one one song per per record and he was writing a lot of music and, you know, he, wa he wanted to go his own way. They, they had more money than God, you know, they, um, it wasn't that, you know, I mean, Paul, as John said, Paul will go on forever. You know, he will, he'll be, you know, for the rest of his life, he's going to be, you know, performing and doing things. But um, I think when I first met them, John was trying to figure out how to do it. You know, it was from his perspective. And I think from both he and Yoko's perspective, it was, it was over with, you know, and they just had to figure out how to do it. Also, it was, millions of pounds involved it was there was a lot of there's the business aspect of how do you do this how do you how do you break up this you know this waterfall of money you know? mm -hmm. right you know i think if you look at the let at the get back documentary that, that peter jackson did um you can kind of answer the heroin question just looking at that because the same day that there is John is at his funniest. He's the, it's the one where he's talking about Baden Powell forbidding Boy Scouts to masturbate, and you know, and how he says, uh, "I I can tell you, you don't go blind, just very short sighted." I mean, this is a hilarious moment for John, and that was you know just a little bit earlier that very same day he had given an interview to the cbc in canada and had to go excuse himself to throw up because he was still sort of under the influence of heroin he had taken just before it so i i think you know we're talking about you know we see when john has taken some heroin um how he's you know needs to to go be sick for a few minutes and then he's back to John at his funniest very shortly after that. So, you know. Would you do? John would, could be sick with, that, with or without heroin. Um, I, did, I never saw him not vomit before going on stage. Right. Um, uh, imagine this. You're the greatest rock and roll star in the world. Maybe, you know, as John said, it's who's bigger, me or Elvis, you know, one day. But, the, you know, you're this incredible, gifted, amazing, not only performer, but you write this incredible music. You're changing the way the, the world sees music. The world is changing and you're, you're part of that change. So every time you open your mouth or step on stage, you have to live up to that. Mm. You can't just have a bad day, you know. Um, and it was it was always under that pressure. I mean, it was a tremendous pressure for him. The last time I saw him, uh, we we we, had, we went off into an office away from all the, the, the attorneys. It was over the lawsuit with Alan, and he stopped being John Lennon and turned into John. You know, when we were alone and we could talk and whatnot, and then so then. As we had to go out, he turned. You literally, his posture would change. The way he touched his hair, everything. He'd have to turn. He'd have to become John Lennon again, and that was a that was an, an immense burden. But yeah, you the, mentioned he lived in a distorted reality, just the way people would behave around him because they didn't even behave like themselves. Imagine this: hmm. every face you see, every voice you hear is trying to figure out what they can get from you and what you want them to say so you'll say the right thing so that you can stay in their presence or close to them. And it's like the end, end of, I don't want to get too, you know, thing, but the end of Dante's uh, um, paradise, the end of the thing, as they get closer to God, everything gets distorted, you know, the and, and, and it was like that around John. It's just like, it was just, it was, it was, uh, so how does he know what's real even? How do you know anybody really cares about him or anybody is serious, you know? And um, and I think that's one thing Yoko always, you know, we, she was not there because he was a rock and roll star, you know, and she was a Beatles fan. She was, she was there because they were in love with each other. And they, yes, they had a lot. They both gained from each other and got from each other. 
but they had this genuine relation. I think that's one of the reasons I stuck around as, as long as I did, because I tell them what I think, you know, I, that's why I didn't want to work for them. You know, I don't want anybody to, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to be able to, you know, I had originally, when I first turned up, because we didn't have a place to stay and Yoko wanted some of her own friends around rather than all these crazy Apple people. And uh, and I was doing a picture, a minor part of the picture with John Voight and I was doing a few other things. And so I, I, was, I was sort of busy. And then I got swept up in their world, which was like this immense vacuum cleaner that just pulled everything into its, into its or, orbit. But I always, you know, John always looked at me not as a rock and roll fan, but this uh, he was very he was funny when we first met we first met. We were very nervous. He was nervous because I was had starred in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and, he, and and I'm I'm going like he's the most famous rock and roll star in the world, you know. There's so, a quote in one of the books um where the Beatles are sitting around reminiscing about Shea Stadium. And, and it's in the 60s, or maybe two years later. And Yoko says, what were you doing in a stadium, in a baseball stadium? <laughs> and we played sold out concerts there. She says, oh, well, I was doing this that year. Like, she's just so in her own head. Well, she was, when she started seeing, I guess, originally, I, I don't know how true this is, but she had approached Paul because she wanted to composers to, to make a, to get a, a bit of this uh, score as a birthday present for John Cage, you know, and Paul has supposedly, supposedly sent her over to, to see John. What? But I can remember her saying, I met this guy who says he's a Beatle, and I guess the Beatles are, are, are pretty important or something, you know? I mean, she, she didn't, there, the house was completely empty. There was nothing in the house. There was no radio. There was no television. There was one, there was a phone. And in the bedroom, there were some tatamis that could be taken out and put on the floor to sleep at night. And in the kitchen, there were two chairs and a kitchen table so the nanny could feed Kyoko. And mm -hmm. there was nothing, you know. And what Yoko was interested in, she, you know, she but it certainly wasn't rock and roll. She knew more about jazz, you know. I mean, that, that's the work she did with Ornette. I mean, you I, think I, growing up in the 30s and 40s that rock and roll didn't exist yet. She didn't have a turntable. She didn't have a record collection. She wasn't thinking of those. She was, then she goes through war. and But I, I think the first song she heard was um, Strawberry Fields, uh, mm -hmm. Beatles song, because an art uh, dealer was playing it at his house. And he said, hey, what do you think about you know, this pop music going into this realm, it's kind of different. And she said, hey, that's some cute stuff. I hear some dissonance in there. And, you know, she's coming at it from that angle. She wasn't, oh, the new Beatle record. Let's hear it. You know? yeah. Yeah. And even her parents record. disapproved of John, right? In the beginning. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know. They didn't want any tickets to a Beatles concert. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were... They were. This is what's popping up now. Liked by Sean. Liked by Sean is retweeting all my stuff here. It's great. Oh. <laughs> and it also should be pointed out that your book is now being sold at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I, it's not sold. It's in the library and archives at the Rock oh, and Roll oh, Hall of oh. Fame. It was a, a recommended by Olivia Harrison on Instagram. And I noticed that the picture she took of the book was by a window and I saw the bricks outside and I'm like, oh my God, it's in Friar Park. Yeah. That's oh wow. Cool. Yeah, it's getting I've not had one bad word. It's just all people loving it. It's yeah, no, it's a wonderful book, man. I, yeah. I just I just couldn't believe it when I started reading it. You know, it's, it's, it's at last I would I had the feeling I had was at last. <laughs> Finally, you know, somebody yeah. somebody telling the truth, you know, telling the story, you know. Yeah, the last chapters are just about truth and how Yoko handles truth and wants truth. And, you know, it's just so important to just show her spirit, I think, yeah. and, and prove to everyone. Because I tried to back up everything I said with now, yeah, quotes from her, which who's going to believe her and me, but then just some historical fact that backs it all up. And there's nobody can argue this. Can we talk a little bit about the aftermath of John's murder? Um, 
if there ever was a true test of her strength, it was tested then. Um, that all of the everything, everything that they had done together, everything that John did on his own leading up to meeting her, everything came into this one point. When all was said and done, John gets murdered. And that's it. And it was like it didn't it didn't reach the promise, it being a generalization, it didn't reach the promised land, if you will, it got snuffed out. Talk about the, I mean, we've already talked about her being a strong person, but my goodness, did would she, did she have to dig down deeper than ever to stay on her feet and keep going like she did in the aftermath of John's passing? And, um, I hate the word death, passing, hmm. um, you know, and really landed on her feet relatively quickly with putting out, going ahead with plans that had been discussed while John was still alive, walking on thin ice, coming out. And then she comes out with her own album. Uh, and it, for me personally, Season of Glass is her, I think it's her finest album, but, you know, someone might disagree. Um, talk about that that period and um, just yeah. where did she get that inner strength to carry on and to see past the ugliness um, that the world displayed on December 8th, 1980? I think um, working, making art, making music, doing whatever was her catharsis. I mean, she did it because of her horrible childhood. She did it because she was misunderstood. So that was her way of healing. Also, she had Sean. She's looking at this little boy that that belongs to her and John. So she's like, I've got to go on. I, I can't just fall into a heap. But, you know, John's death wasn't the worst of it. It just kept being more piled on more and more people, you know, her trusted employees stealing from her, people wanting to write untrue lies and books and um, kidnapping threats, death threats, but she refused to leave her home. You know, she, she was steadfast there because that's where she lived with John. And um, I just try to, there's this chapter all about the aftermath pretty much. And I tried to show how they were living there and, you know, right, right towards the end. Um, they were very peaceful for five years, raising their son. I wanted to show that they were a family. These aren't just a bunch of celebrities that we're talking about. Um, one of the quotes I use is that, you know, she was talking about how when John was killed, um, they had cats. The three, three cats would sit on the radio whenever his voice would come on. And, and they were never the same since they would hide in corners. I just wanted to show, you know, just a little tip of the iceberg of what she might have gone through. And, you know, we I don't even know half of it, right? So it just got worse and worse. And the way she dealt with it was working and making music. She put out Walking on the Nice pretty much right away, you know, and then she put out Season of a Glass less than a year later. So, you know I don't mean to interrupt you, but you say how things got worse and worse in the aftermath of John's death. And I remember, um, again, I was a teenager and and I'm, I'm, I'm in an all boys high school and it's a cruel world, you know, that that setting. And I remember when Walking on Thin Ice came out, it was in the spring, if I'm not mistaken. It was just a few months after his murder and the season of Glass record coming out. I remember hearing all the vicious things about her being solely in it for the money. Now she's putting out her own music uh, to try to cash in while it's still fresh in everyone's mind. And the bloody eyeglasses on the cover, isn't that horrible? Um, and it was just like, do you people shut up? You know, are you seriously? Well, and it was like, it was immediate instant. It was the norm pile on and beat up Yoko, even though now she don't get, catch a break no but you know that's what sells papers and i was told that some of the interviews in my book uh were unpublished and i asked the writers you know this was so beautiful why wasn't it 
used. And they said, well, um, they kind of rejected it because they told me either I have to spice it up, quote unquote, with some lies, I suppose, or, you know, and, and some of them had the integrity to pull it, thank goodness. But most of them didn't. They just would write lies about her, outright lies. It's just a continuation of what had been going on beforehand, the, the way she had been treated. And it, 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 as I said before, it, it's only really recently that she's got, you know, finally got free of most of that. Yeah. A little too late for my liking, you know, but at least it's happening and maybe we can move forward and it's actually a compliment to you, Madeline, because your book is going to go far in so. changing the the, 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 the landscape um, because it is by far and away the definitive look at really it's it's a it's a biography. It's it's a novel. It's a reference guide. It's all of these things for an artist that needed more than ever to have it all kind of summed up in one place and explained yeah. in one place. Definitely. And I, I even find some people are, you know, dressing up like her or her and John, and they're just seeing it on the surface. So they're liking grapefruit and they think it's cute. But I want them to know how serious, you know, she is. And all through the book is just one person called it page after page of wisdom. But it's all her, you know, and it all needs to be heard. Mm -hmm. Could you explain to a lot of people who don't understand her art what the purpose would be in shooting a film where you're showing people's rear ends? I well, mean... That, that, okay. So I'm sure, you know, she was taking that a little bit lightly as well. She she actually said that that was more about the rhythm of the motion of the, of the four quadrants of the film. And that's maybe the first place that a beat came into her life. She just really thought that was interesting. She was all about the visual with that. And then of course, you know, that aspect of art versus entertainment, like she was happy if everybody left the and the audience walked out because then you've really said something, you've really shaken them up. And just everything involved with that, just the fact that it was censored and she did a protest on the street with giving out daffodils and she won over the board of censors, but she saw they had all the flowers and vases on their desks and who could refuse her, right? So they gave her an X rating, so she showed it at night. But then even after that, she would be in the theater and she would hug and kiss everybody that left the theater, no matter at what point they left. It's just incredibly innocent in a way. And just the way, the same way that um, fly isn't about a fly walking on a nude woman. It's about the fly, you know, <laughs> it's it's about where you're looking because it all stems from a joke where, you know, the guy seeing a woman with, it says, did you see that woman's hat? And the guy's busy looking at her cleavage. So that's, she just wants you to look in a different place, in a different way. And, you know, just show you that you have the power to see the truth. I mean, there's a couple of things, her pieces, one of them was called Three Spoons and, and it's four spoons. So what's it showing you? It's telling you there's three, but you see another one, but it's telling you that's not there. You know, you just think a little bit. And even the white chess set, just she wants you to not be able to know which piece is yours. You have to, you can't possibly keep track of a game that way. And we're on the level playing field and it's called play it by trust. And she says, you know, that she, she did trust everybody. And even though everything crazy has happened to her, she still thinks it's healthier to just keep that trust, but always look for truth. Also, all, all of her art exists on, on multiple levels. I mean, Yoko has a great sense of humor, uh, mm -hmm. which I think people don't, aren't getting a lot of the time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, she also has a, a, a profound aesthetic i mean the fact that you can take people's buttocks and turn them into this aesthetically gorgeous configuration or in fly where the fly is walking along the body that the body is no longer a body anymore you know it is these beautiful lines and it's, at one point it almost looks like it's the desert you know this, yeah mountains the I mean, so it did. And yet at the same time, you know, there's Virginia lying there with her legs spread apart, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. you know, and a loft on the Bowery. Uh, you know, it's, it's it exists on many, many levels, as most really fine art does. 
Right. And then and the film Rape, which now that's interesting. I don't think that could even be made today because that woman was found and she was chased on the street and 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 forced into just becoming jelly. She had a meltdown because this camera crew, she's friendly at first, right? And then the camera crew's following and following. And um they I think Yoko was had her sister in on it and her sister gave the camera people the key to her apartment. So she went into her own apartment for shelter and they followed her in there and she was freaking out. And she was especially freaked out. She was Hungarian, this actress. Well, she wasn't even an actress. She claimed she was an actress afterwards because now she'd been in a film. Right. But uh, she, her visa had expired or, and she was really nervous and she thought maybe this was something to do with that. So you see this happening. It's almost like a snuff film where somebody's actually being killed. It's, you know, she's really being followed and she's really being terrorized. But, um, and the film is called Rape, but there's no nudity. There's no pornography. You know, it's just about the rape of your psyche and or the pursuit of a woman. It could be a lot of things. And then Yoko realized, you know, it was be she conceived of that before she even met John. And and it ended up being her in a sense in the media circus being chased like she was. So it's amazing just the levels and levels of meaning in, in her her work. Yeah, the, the wonderful thing is is it's like when we made Fly and Up Your Legs Forever, we I think we did it in about five or six days. The, the this uh, ability of these two incredibly creative people to just do just it, was, it just kept coming out of them they just just you know we had met with um, Jonas Mikas at the our anthology film archives uh, to show Jonas some of John Yoko's the experimental films they had, they had been made, making it Jonas said oh I'd love to you know do a John Yoko film festival and um and he said, well, we've got the, the theater. I forget what it's a theater. The Elgin, I think, yeah. Yeah, it changed its name since what it was originally. And, um, but it was like six or seven days away, you know. And, um, and, and Yoko said, well, we can do that. We can, we'll, we'll make two new movies for you, for, for you. To do it. And we did it. We just literally, in working round the clock, you know, uh, with multiple venues and, because we were shooting two films at the same time, you know, it wasn't just one, and we did the whole thing in about a week. You know? I want to know the details of the flies. Did you really get them from restaurants? Yeah, we were paying a quarter a fly. The what had happened was is that when we were doing, we had a scene in two thousand and one where we, I, I end up killing, you know, a, a tapir, and and we start eating meat, you know, so that we become powerful, and. And Stanley wanted the shot of us eating meat and flies crawling around on our face, you see, around the meat. Mm -hmm. and so we tried painting sugar water on the faces and things. We couldn't get it. And this, the, the AD, Derek Cracknell, had an idea, and that was to take a fly, put it in a cup, and squirt a little bit of carbon dioxide in there so there'd be no oxygen, and then take the top off and look. And we found that if, at about... 45 seconds, the fly wasn't dead, but couldn't fly for a minute or two and could only walk, you know. So yeah. I have remembered this, you see. And, ah. uh, and so here we are, and uh, the, we, we needed somebody who wouldn't move, you know, and so we ended up getting Virginia who was using a uh, heroin at the time so she yeah, was, i joked in the in the chapter on that film i was did she have co2 as well <laughs> like <laughs> yeah exactly and and we we do you know and so we had scores of people running around uh, you know all the the restaurants and cafeterias and things around the bowery catching flies and we were we were buying flies you know and, and we had a couple tanks of co2 and we would uh, we'd zap them I wonder if Bunuel uh, and Dali got their flies that way. But pardon? Bunuel and Dali. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I asked oh. Yoko for. Um, I said to her for the soundtrack. You know, um, you got inside of the mind of a fly. How did you did such a good job? How did you do that? And she goes, "Well, thank you. What I did it. You know, I was inside the mind. I was feeling like a fly that day. <laughs> she had to really." Get into you know, they did that uh, i think one night up in the the, the i guess it was in the regency um 
And a lot of it is, you know, the, John had always used backward tapes, you know, uh, in, the, in the Beatles day, you know, starting with the Strawberry Field, uh, you know, the, I guess we're actually in Rubber Soul, they started doing things, but the, the um, uh, you know, this, the idea that you can run things backward and you get wonderful, you, these wonderful sounds out of them. Yeah, that was part of it. That was beautiful. Because people uh, laugh at me, they'll play a little bit of Fly on the, the Fly album, and they'll go, "Which section is this?" And I'll tell them, "Oh, that's that's the beginning. That's the end." How do you know? <laughs> like, just... Well, you know, and that film was really well received at Con, and uh, uh, we we um, we cut it. I did. A, I I cut I, I cut some fat out of it and got it to flow a bit. And we showed it and Apotheosis. At, Apotheosis is a film John had made where they're, the two of them are in a balloon and they go up through the clouds and finally they come out of the clouds above the, the clouds. It was a beautiful, beautiful little film. And we showed that at Con and got a, a standing ovation. And, uh, and then I did another cut after that, which I guess is the one that's used now. There's a story that um, Bottoms was supposed to be shown at um, Experimental Film Festival. And the judges wanted to give it a prize, but Yoko and Tony didn't submit the proper <laughs> registration forms. Something so. like that. I can't remember, but there was something where they protested at some some place where they took all their clothes off. You know. Oh uh, right, that was that was at the same event. Yeah. yeah, it was very liberating when you you don't need clothes. <laughs> right. Do either of you think any of the, 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 these films or collected version of them will ever come out? I do now that that respect for her is being realized, and yeah, I think so. Well, some of the some of the films are really wonderful. Uh, um, they're, re I mean, really wonderful, and our 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 classics. I mean, Smile, mm -hmm. oh, it's just uh, it's just gorgeous. They've been showing them uh, at her exhibitions. In fact, at her concerts, they play some of them before she comes on stage. And then at the MoMA retrospective in 2015, she did a whole night of film talks and we're sitting in the front row with her watching all the films. And then she she answered questions about them all. It was wonderful. I think I think the certainly the art world is she will they will always be uh, appreciated and and you know you'll they will be seen you know. I mean, they're out there. Uh, there are bootleg copies of, of most of them floating around. It just seems like, you know, it's actually an important body of work that, you know, should be put out in a collected edition with a nice book and, you know. The whole well, thing. particularly because this was there from an artistic point of view. I think these were the most important films later, later with Imagine, which is not really a film on itself and not really just a music video it's a it became a, a mishmash of styles and and had because it had different purposes uh but the, the those films that 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 you know like fly and apotheosis and smile and two virgin all of that that's those films are made to be just films in their own right as works of art mm -hmm. and uh and they uh, and they achieve that you yeah. know I don't think I don't think any they've I don't think Yoko's done anything since that 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 gets to touches what they as goes as far as they went, you know. That's my opinion. I don't know. I think she stopped making films. Why? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah, maybe she wasn't around film people that could help her with it. I mean, she just went on to do music basically i think she really felt solace in the music mostly um and she didn't even start her artwork up again until 1989 when the whitney that started the whitney showed her films right that was the last time yeah, they really showed. Yeah. and they said she said okay you can show the films but i need to show the work also so that's when she had done the bronze age she did all of her objects uh that were transparent or white, and she had them all in bronze side by side. It was very oh. extremely cool. What was this? When was the show in San Francisco? The what? What? Oh, the exhibition. Oh God, twenty. Was it the nineties or? 10? I didn't go to that. Yeah, the late nineties. Because I know I I I I I went up and visited her in her hotel room when she when she was there because you know we, I, actually I was interviewing her for my first book. 
Oh. One of, the one about 2001. Okay. So. Well, there's been so many now, so many exhibitions worldwide. All around the world. China, Mexico, everywhere is great. And I can't be happier. Millions of people are seeing her work now. Can I can I ask so, but you know I, I would just want to say I think the earliest work are in many ways the greatest masterpieces. I think so. I think cut piece is as could is up there with anything, any other conceptual piece that anybody ever ever conceived of. I think so. Um, yeah, it's 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 because it's work her stuff works on a lot of different levels, as we were saying before. You know, you can there's always there's always some humor. There's always some some wisdom. There's always some uh, really fine aesthetics. She had one piece she used to with, that she did at Little Carnegie where she, her the instructions for the performers you sit on the stage until all the audience leaves, and you know and you don't do anything. I saw and pictures I, of that recently. It's great. And, and she said to me, "Well, I, it was working fine. Everybody finding people were figuring it out and just leaving." And she said there was this one guy. And I knew he was not going. To, he was, he was, he was not, and I was stuck there. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you to talk a little bit about uh, um, your favorite recordings of hers, your favorite albums? Uh, the, uh, in a nutshell, the uh, the essential Yoko Ono albums. Well, it has to be a very big nutshell. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. a big nutshell. Yes. Maybe Dan can start. Well, uh, I, I'm I'm a little biased because I love I love what she did with Ornette at the, the Albert Hall uh, because that was before she was influenced by rock and roll at all, you know. And it was just it was just pure Yoko and pure Ornette, and they just the, the way they the way they worked together was was absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I usually pick things like I, I have to do like crazy mid-range and then the the beautiful quiet thing so the crazy thing you know everybody picks why i kind of like that i like greenfield morning you know that that plastic on an album is incredible um and then i love fly because it's the album it's got some rockers on there midsummer new york it's got the ethereal mrs lennon it, you know it's really when she first started the song structures um, and then it's got the the Kraut Rock of Mind Train, and then I think everybody's favorite is Approximately Infinite Universe because that is a full range as Elephant's Memory Band, which is so amazing. Yeah. It has some, you got the poster behind you, right? It's fifty year anniversary um, yesterday of the album. It uh, was a real album. Good to know. Mm hmm. And. Uh, so that's got Winter Song, which is just gorgeous. John always says he wishes he had written that one. It's so delicate. And it's got very Japanese-influenced lyrics. And, of course, Death of Samantha, which is very intense. It was about John's first infidelity to Yoko. Um, and then, you know, Feeling the Space is her pretty much feminist album. But I love the, the later stuff, Between My Head and the Sky, um, you know, Take Me to the Land of Hell, seeing her doing those in concert, incredible. She went back to the, you know, avant-garde kind of stuff a bit in those. And she's just always been so sincere and genuine. And I just, I just love it all. <laughs> she has an immense body of work, would you think of it now? Oh, yeah. It's just amazing. And the fact that she's always kept evolving, always, always explored new things and never, never, it's, it, it, she, it's, oh, she's always, sees it has a new vision, a new way of looking at things. I was disappointed when, um, I guess it was Simply Canadian, the label, uh, was doing the really? radio. Secretly Canadian. Secretly Canadian. Mm -hmm. uh, was doing the reissues with uh, Sean's label. And they just stopped. They didn't. They never did continue on and do all of the albums. Uh, I had contacted the label. You know, um, <clears throat> it was a I, WFUV. Uh, my radio station was playing few people that were on that label, and I said, "Where's the can? You know, you're up to the '80s period now. Where are the Yoko albums? And even some of the employees, they didn't know what happened to that reissue project, which was a shame." 
because they were getting all these records back out there uh mm. and it just stalled you know um once the 80s when once they were up to the 80s yeah nobody knows what happened with that it's sad but maybe they'll continue it's n- never too late i just want to say that yoko's music is something that over time i've come to really appreciate but more than anything as someone who likes variety her music is all over the place mm-hmm. i mean she's as eclectic as you can get and whether you want to talk about a plastic on old band album or something like that or approximately infinite universe which is very diverse i love the fact that she can write really great ballads very melodic stuff like we mentioned winter song um now we're never uh stuff like that and then death of samantha which to me is very it's like a you're in a nightclub <laughs> and you're listening to the four also, you can't uh, you can't you can't underestimate the the influence she had on john's music mm-hmm. so that uh, uh you know we could talk just about yoko's stuff but the 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 music that john did after he met yoko was changed basically by yoko you know yeah and by the way i put all her albums throughout the story i don't shove them in the back it, it's right. as they happen in the chronology because it's all what's happening in her life Hey, Dan, right. could you just explain a little bit more about what you said, how Yoko's music really influenced John's music? Because to me, apart from why I'd mentioned before with um, John's vocalizations on Cold Turkey and and the Plastic Ono Band stuff, Mother and Well, 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 and that kind of thing, I know his stuff was a lot more deeply personal and introspective. And I think that was Yoko's influence to me anyway. Also, the lyrics. What's that? The way he used words after he met Yoko. You know, I mean, uh, the dream is, you know, the you know God and so so, but but imagine itself. You know, just that song. That those are Yoko's words. You know, Mm -hmm. right. And well, and she was real. And she was she. They she now has credit for 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 that. Right. Even since um, he met her, he got into haiku. And he even that song, My Mummy's Dead, that's yeah. all influenced by the flow of a haiku poem. Yeah. I, if, John, if John hadn't met Yoko, all of those, we would have had some great music from him, but we would have never, it would never have been as great. Uh, uh, and I can, I, I say that with confidence, you know, I, I, it's, it's my opinion, but I, I think it's pretty clear. No. I think there's something about Yoko's songwriting in, in, her, in her pop style that people don't see uh, in, in the sense that they're not taking the songs as abstract things on their own, um, you know, that exist without a performance. Um, and people who dislike them often, you know, they just aren't used to Yoko's voice. They'll never get used to Yoko's voice. They just don't like it. But there are these two albums of covers now. There's Every Man had, Has a Woman. And uh, there's one that just came out like within the past year. I forget the title. Oh, oh, God. God. Yeah. yeah, but they're both really good albums. And they show that these songs, you know, apart from Yoko's performances whether you like them or hate them the songs themselves are really durable songs you know and if you give them to somebody else who you know exerts their own creative ideas about what the backings are and sings it in the way they sing it you know it's going to be different from Yoko but the songs themselves are strong and um and I think those two albums have done that and uh I you know I'd kind of like to see more people cover her stuff you know just 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 take it up and do it because they're good songs that that was clear with the 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 thing at disney hall the the philharmonic hall that that evening where other other artists were singing yoko's songs i was i was and i know yoko and i know the work but i was personally surprised at how how beautiful they were into the interpretations of the work they had a they had a children's choir singing a lot of it was just so beautiful and the songs songs lived without yoko they had the life of their life of their own you know yeah i mean i thought ocean child was a wonderful record and the people 
that uh, Benjamin Gibbard of Death Cab for Cutie brought into the project, you could tell they totally, they totally get it when it comes to what Yoko was all about, what her music was about. There was a lot of love in that album, cohesiveness in that album. Um, a little more so, I thought, than Every Man Has a Woman. Uh, but, uh, and I have fond memories of that one because we played, we used to play that a lot on WFUV. That was a little bit of me kind of influencing uh, my coworkers to check this album out. And, you know, before you start saying, making any comments, look, Roseanne Cash is here. Elvis Costello is a fantastic version of Walking on Thin Ice on that. And uh, that was right after she put out Star Piece and I had arranged uh, a Star Piece um, uh, promotion at WFUV where we were giving the album away with T-shirts. And um, so I have mem fond memories of when I uh, when a man loves a woman. But the, the record from last year was really, uh, I thought. Exceptional. It's almost like, you know, it was almost like how, what, what, how John felt. Uh, when he went to uh, the Bahamas in the 80s and was in the nightclub and he hears B-52s and he's like, holy smoke, they got it. They think yeah. that, that, you know, she's they finally listened. And a little bit, it seems as though the artists of today, some of the newer artists get it. They, You know, it's a different generation. They get it without any of the baggage that... Uh, has been put upon her music. The St. Vincent's, uh, the, um, good, no, I gotta, it's a very dangerous thing to trust my memory. So I'll just leave it at an artist like St. Vincent, because it's the, she's the only one I can think of right now, uh, <laughs> who's on the album. They get it. And, and they really did uh, her material uh, with a lot of love. Ocean Child, Songs of Yoko Ono, I believe, is a full. This is the first birthday of hers. I know it's the 90th, so I guess there's more attention. But there are different, um, a lot of people are doing tributes um, in all different ways, either performing her art or making documentaries or be radio specials just about her now. This never happened before. No. no. That's fantastic to hear. It's high time. Mm -hmm. But we've now had two this year because we had Madeline on before. Right. <laughs> it's a, it's a... And there's going to be more of it because we'll be having Madeline on again. And there's, there's still, I mean, we're talking about the films. Wouldn't it be great if they come out? Because uh, on, on these radio shows, we try to cover everything. Like maybe we should do one about the films or one, you know, just really get in. Cause I love the details like Dan sees in the book. I, I love all the crazy little details. Oh, it's, 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 I, it's <laughs> wonderful, Madeline. You know, I mean, it's just, I, you, you've, you've done so much research, you know, it brings it, it brings things to life when you have that level of detail. Yeah. I mean, and partially I didn't really research. I grew up with this stuff and I yeah. knew what was important and I knew, and I was always looking for uh, something in an interview they would say the same things over and over but oh in this interview oh she said this I never knew that and you know I, I like to pull out things from the beyond that I could that were important you, you 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 sort of have probably without trying have been like an archivist mm -hmm. as a hobby as a, a collector at home because you got pleasure out of it and then you I think you said this when we interviewed you then you looked at everything and you're like holy it's a book this can be with a little, you know, massaging here and there. This is a book. And yeah, you've also done and it still took website. two years to put it together. I, you know, I had it all in individual right. stories. But. Your website, which is Madeline X? Well, that's my blog. It's MadelineX.com. And that's my rock and roll blog. I write about But if you go there, there. And there's can, a lot of stuff in there. You will see Iggy Pop. You will see Sparks. You will see Ian Hunter getting a similar treatment mm -hmm. that Yoko got. So, folks, we can anticipate biographies of these artists in the years to come. Oh, maybe I'll just put together the whole blog in a book. but Putting pressure on you. But check out the website for the book because I'm starting to post excerpts there. And it's inyourmindbook.com. I got to write that down. Write everything in down. your mind is this backwards? I know some people have. No, no, your right. Mind, right. oh, you're right. You're good. No. Um, you mentioned briefly, Dan. Um, uh, and I want I just want 
for the folks that may not have picked up on it or might not realize this, I got to be honest with you. If I knew this, I, it slipped my mind. You're in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Can you please tell us about where, when the movies, you watch the movie, where will we see Dan in that film? Well, I, I, the first 18 minutes of the film is called The Dawn of Man. Right. And, um, I, um, I choreographed that and helped develop the costumes and cast it. And I ended up playing the, the lead man ape, you know, moon watcher. And so I'm, I guess I'm best known, best known for that. Uh, I did other things on the film. I, I worked with Stanley for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did some of the Stargate, helped on the Stargate sequence when Bowman goes through the, you know, goes through the, you know, he goes through all those beautiful colors and things like that, you know. So I did a lot of work on the film, but I'm best known for the opening of the film, which is pretty much I created. But Stanley created it. I helped him create it. You know, it was his vision. That's wild. That's that's fascinating. Yeah. A good a good Bronx boy, Stanley Kubrick. Yes. <laughs> he never lost his Bronx accent either. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. A wonderful man, by the way. I mean, every portray him as this obsessive, compulsive, recluse, and things. He wasn't that at all. He was funny. He was easy to get along with. He just liked to work round the clock forever, and do endless amount of takes, and just just get it a little bit better each time. It's a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. You know, he's an amazing photographer too. Yes, and I think that's a foundational to his work is the fact that he was such a good photographer. He he left school. He didn't even complete uh, high school to to be a photographer, professional photographer. I guess was, was it was it was a book or Collier's or one of those that he he worked for. You know, as as a teenager, uh, and he was a uh, just his visual sense. He a lot of the camera work. I mean, you know. It's, he worked with some wonderful directors of photography, but so much of the camera work is 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 him, you know. I mean, and the directors of photography are just helping him do what he knew he knew more than everybody else about you know what he was doing. He was because he became an expert on everything that he was interested in or that he was going to touch, you know. He would just uh, you know, and he would you know, I mean and we would talk about everything under the sun, you know. We talk about, you know. Bill Burroughs' cut-up method of, of writing or Napoleon's strategy at Austerlitz and then about the film that we were working on, you know, and then uh, just uh, this poly polymath, is that the word? Did you ever introduce him to Yoko? You know, I didn't, you know, and I wish I, wish I had. I wish I had. Yeah. No, he was just always so busy, you know. I would have had to bring her around. You know that was that would have been the the only way. Yeah. All right. Um, if somebody wants to reach out to you, uh, Dan, is there a uh, Dan uh, DanRichter dot com? You know, and you can send me emails from there, or whatever. R i c h t e r d a n r i c h t e r dot com. It's my website. Okay. Um, and there's a way to reach me. Reach me there. Uh, happy to communicate with folks and i'm looking at your website right now and madeline I tell have. Me the websites again, again one more time for those like me that okay the book website well my blog which is separate from everything it's just all my rock and roll is madelinex.com and the book website is inyourmindbook.com and the shop where you can, the only place you can get the hardcover version of the book with the option of having it signed by me is conceptualbooks.com. Okay. And I guess uh, you guys, the other guys here, <laughs> Alan, hit us with the... Uh, okay. Actually, we have uh, that info now you're putting that on, on the screen, right? That's true. Uh, it, it's in in all of our contact information is in the um, description of the show oh. underneath. But you right. can you can get to me at, at you can get to all of us at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com, and uh, feel free to suggest ideas, respond to what you've seen, whatever you want, mm -hmm. um, and otherwise you can just 
get me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And there is a uh, McCartney Legacy Facebook page. Just look up McCartney Legacy on Facebook. And there's McCartneyLegacy.com, which is website for the book. Ken? If you want to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. On my own YouTube channel, I just did my first all Beatles trivia show where I invited the three co-hosts of Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and had a lot of fun with Beatles trivia and Beatles games like I do every week on my website and what I've been doing on the radio for almost 41 years. Um, and also we interviewed Alan here and Adrian Sinclair for that new book, The McCartney Legacy. That was our most recent show, which you can find on all the audio outlets out there and on our YouTube channel, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. My YouTube channel is Ken Michaels Radio. So you got those two YouTube channels. And um, that's basically it. All righty. And for me, WFUV Radio, if you want to listen, and why would you not want to listen? Uh, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, Monday through Thursday nights. And Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4, you'll hear moi spinning tunes. Uh, and if you want to get in touch with me, I mean, the best thing to do is Facebook. I've got two pages. If you'll find one of them, I'll hook you up with the other page then. And uh, then you can see my music posts and my baseball posts and other random madness things and when my neighbor aggravates me and i gotta vent somewhere i vent there on facebook uh and uh so that's a place to come for me and uh this has been yet another show where if i may if i may say so myself where uh, i had a great time and uh this was an important show and happy birthday to yoko what might yoko be doing uh for her 90th um, she's Does been... anyone have any idea what, uh, if uh, any plans that Yoko will little party or something that she <laughs> might have? I know she's with family and good friend Elliot Mintz, and she's going to be at home with them. Great. Can I say? I wish point? you. I'm sorry, I, Ken. Ken's interrupting me here. I forgot to mention that on the other uh, podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Our next guest will be. Madeline <laughs> for okay. another Yoko tribute show. So uh yeah, and Elliot Mintz's birthday was yesterday. So happy birthday to you, Elliot. We all send good wishes and our love to you. Yep. Yoko, of course. So that's all I wanted to say. Well, thank you. Madeline, it is a pleasure once again to have you back here. And we will be having you back again and again and again. And awesome. we'll see you at the Fest for Beetle fans. Yes. In, uh, two months? One month? Wow. Five weeks from now, about. Yeah. And Dan, what an honor meeting you and uh, hearing your stories and your take on uh, on Yoko. And thank you for taking a couple of hours out of your day to uh, hang out with us and talk Yoko. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. And now later on, I, I am going to watch once again. It's been a little a little while, the beginning of 2001 again, I go, I know him. <laughs> to my family, I know that guy. <laughs> but uh, for Alan Cozen, the one and only Ken Michaels, and Dan Richter, and Madeline Boccaro, I'm Darren DeVivo, and I want to thank you for watching things we said today, uh, or listening to things we said today, or both, and we will see you in a couple of weeks, and peace and love to you all, and again, happy birthday. Yoko Happy birthday, Yoko. Happy birthday, Yoko.